Hey everybody, this is Robert Burke. Welcome to episode number 23 of When to Play. And today I'm not going to be talking about a specific game. I'm going to be talking more generally about board gaming etiquette. So I have reduced down my personal kind of pet peeves and things I need to work on myself into a top 20 list. So these are the top 20 board gaming etiquette items that I think we all need to think about from time to time. Uh, when I first got into back into to board gaming, I was just amazed because everybody I met was just incredible. They were incredible people. They were smart. They were witty. Uh, I made a lot of friends. So it was a really incredible experience for me to discover uh, the hobby. But as I've expanded and I've started playing at different conventions and I've started going outside into different groups and playing with lots and lots more people, um, you know, that kind of fairy tale image that I had of board gaming uh, has had some cracks in it. Because in board gaming, like in any kind of hobby uh, or any kind of group of people, you're not going to like everybody, so you just need to realize that. Not everybody, you're not going to click with everybody. There's going to be people you don't like. There's going to be selfish people. There's going to be people that have issues. Um, and that's true in board gaming like anywhere else. So that's why I kind of felt the need to, to go over what I think some just basic etiquette items that we should all think about so we're not one of those people uh, that someone says, oh, I don't really want to play with them because of this or that. So um, so let's get down to it. Here are my top 20, and I'm going to start um, from 20 and go back. Number 20, offer to help. If you go to a regular meetup group maybe once a week where you play games, or maybe you go to a friend's house uh, you know, on the last Friday of every month, if you have a, if you're involved in a consistent gaming group, whether it's just your own circle of friends or the larger community, then offer to help. You know, offer your house once in a while to to have games. If that's not possible for you, reach out to the group leader, right, or to the friend who is the, the one taking the lead within your within your friends to play. And offer to help them. Offer to come over early and set up. Offer to stay late and help clean up. Offer to bring snacks. Offer to help in any way that you can. Now, most of the time, probably 95% of the time, they're going to say, no, I've got it. Don't worry about it. But thanks for offering. But people really appreciate the offer. Uh, so always, always offer. It doesn't mean you're going to have to do it every week, that you're going to have to be involved. But offer your time and your talents in any way you can to contribute to, to the community. Um, so this is a small one, and if you don't do that, I don't think it's going to be huge. Like, oh, that guy never helps at all. I don't think that's the case. But it's going to put you over and above, right? If you're that person who's always offering to help, who's always offering their space for a game, uh, then people are going to know that, right? And people are going to want you to be part of the group. So... I think that is my number 20, is offer to help. Even if it's just something small, always offer to number help. Number 19, wait on people. So this one applies to everybody, but especially if you are a group leader, if you host a gaming group, or if you host a game at your house, then this is a pretty basic thing that sometimes people will forget. So let's, for example, say that you know that you have nine people coming uh, to a game night and you are the host. And so you get eight people there and somebody is late. That's another number here, but I'm not going to talk about that right now. But let's say you know you have nine coming, you've got eight people there, and you've got two people that want to play two different four-player games. All right. So if though if eight if you the eight people there start to four player games, then when that other person arrives, they are left out, right? Because those games are already full. So 
instead play some small filler games. That's why it's important, uh, especially if you're a group leader, that you have some filler games that people can play. And it's good to have some filler games that you can play with a large number of people. Something like The Resistance, for example, is a good one. It's very quick and it plays a lot of people. Or Seven Wonders, that's a good one. So that lets you have fun and play something for 15 minutes or a half an hour until that person arrives. All right. Now, if they are more than 15 minutes late, then you probably want to call them and say, hey, are you coming? Um, and if they say, yeah, I'm on my way, then you want to wait for them. You want to show them that courtesy, right? Now, they shouldn't be late, but things happen, right? People could get a, you know, a flat tire or whatever. Things happen. They could be held up at work. That happens. So, um, so try to wait on people as best you can to make sure that when they arrive that they can get into a game. But obviously, this also ties into make sure, making sure you RSVP. If they have an RSVP to your game night and they're coming and you don't know they're coming, then you don't need to wait on them. And that's also another number I'm going to talk about. But number 19, wait on people. Number 18, be on time. This is a very basic one. And this ties into waiting on people, right? You should never make people in your group wait on you. Try your best to be on time. If, if a game night is starting at 7 p.m. and you have RSVP'd, be there at 7 p.m. Leave early if you have to. If you know that there's traffic in the area that you have to drive through to get to the game night, leave early. Give yourself plenty of time to arrive. If you know that you can't make it at 7 o'clock but can make it at 7.30, let them know that in the RSVP. Let them say, hey, I'm coming, but I'm not going to make it until 7.30. If you Now, some stuff happens, right? So I don't know what could happen. Maybe your, you know, your child, uh, you know, fell in the yard and scraped their knee, and you had to take care of them. Maybe you ran into a really bad traffic jam because of an accident. You know, things happen that can make you late, right? And that's okay. But communicate it. Let people know. Text them. Call somebody. Let them know. Hey, I'm running late. I should be about here at such and such a time. Because when people know you're coming, they're waiting for you, right? Because they have a game, maybe somebody has a game planned that they want you to be part of. And if you're not there, then they're just, you know, sitting around waiting for you. Hopefully they have some fillers to play. But let them know. So be on time. Try your best to be on time. And in those cases where you are late for something beyond your control, call somebody and let them know. Number 17. Don't show up to an event if you haven't RSVP'd and expect to play. Now, I think it's totally acceptable for you to come to an event that you haven't RSVP'd for. Maybe you even RSVP'd saying you couldn't come, but something changed and you could come. So you then you go to the event. However, if you go to the event and people have already planned a game and or they're playing a game then don't expect to be able to jump into that game, right? Because that's not really fair. Because other people RSVP'd and they said, hey, I'm going, do you guys want to play Game of Thrones? And they get six people that are going to play Game of Thrones. And then you show up, don't get mad because you can't get in to that Game of Thrones session, right? Because you didn't RSVP, all right? If you, RSVPing to an event is important because it lets everybody know who's coming, how many people are there, lets people know what games they can choose from. So, you know, if you don't RSVP, people aren't going to be waiting on you because they think you're not coming, right? So don't not RSVP and then show up and expect that you're going to play what you want to play. Sure, you can still go to the event, but you're going to be at the mercy of who's left to play with and what people have decided to play and that kind of thing. Now, hopefully, your group is a good group, right? And if you show up on time without RSVPing, they'll be able to work you in and we'll, everybody will be able to play something that they want to play. That's not a hard thing to do. And that's another part of this etiquette uh, list that I'm going to talk about. Um, but for your part, if you don't RSVP, 
don't show up and expect to play something that you want to play. Number 16, show up, okay? This is an important one. This is probably the most basic one. And it still happens, like for the game group that I run, almost every week. There's somebody that RSVPs, that they're coming, and they don't show up. Not cool, don't do that, all right? Don't RSVP or, or, or RSVP and say you're not coming. Or at the very least, if something happens and you can't make it, that's okay, because we understand that things come up, right? So if something comes up and you said you were going and all of a sudden you can't go, then let somebody know, send them an email, or go back on Meetup and change your status to not going, or give somebody a call and say, oh, something came up, I can't make it, I'm sorry. That's okay, but if you say you're going and don't show up and don't let anybody know, that's not acceptable. That's, now, you're, now you're impacting other people besides yourself, because you got to understand, people in a, in a group, when people are getting together, they might have a game in mind, right, that they want to play. And and you've RSVP'd, you said you're coming, so if they're a good group, they're going to wait on you. They're going to be waiting on you. They're not going to be playing. They're not going to be doing the thing that they love to do because they're waiting on you because they're a good group and they want you to be part of it. But you haven't showed up. So that's not cool because you're impacting other people's night. So don't. If, if you're not going to show up, let somebody know that you can't show up. All right. Now, again, it's okay if something comes up, but let somebody know. It's never okay. It's never okay for you to RSVP and then not show up because you changed your mind or you didn't feel like it or you know you were too tired after work or something like that that's not a valid excuse all right but you can still call and say hey I can't make it you know I'm not feeling I'm feeling tired you can you can do that that's that's okay it's not ideal but at least that's okay if you let people know but if you RSVP and don't show up and don't let anybody know that's not acceptable. It's not cool. Don't do it. This is an important one. Um, so pay attention to number 16 if you don't pay attention to any other number on this list. Don't RSVP that you're going to go to a session and not show up and not let anybody know. Number 15, RSVP. This is an important one, especially if you're using Meetup. Or if you're having a, a large gathering at somebody's house, then it's really important, right? So if you're invited to a game night at your friend's house on Saturday at 6 o'clock, let them know one way or another if you're going to go. Yes, I'll be there. No, I won't be there. It's very easy to do. It takes two seconds to respond to an email or to click a button on Meetup, or to you know call your friend and say, yeah, I'll be there, or no, I can't make it. Very simple, right? It's hard for an organizer to plan an event if they don't know how many people are coming. If it's at somebody's house, they're probably planning to have snacks and drinks, right? How many chairs are they gonna need? Basic stuff like that. So if you don't RSVP, it's kind of rude, right? Because now you're putting them in a position where they don't really know if you're coming or not. So they've got to account for you, right? And if you don't show up, now they've bought too much food or they've bought too much, they bought too many drinks, right? Or they haven't set up the, you know, maybe they had to pull extra chairs out of the attic to get ready for everybody who didn't RSVP. And if those people don't come, then you just made your friend do a lot more work than they had to do. So this is a common, I mean, you'll find this kind of etiquette thing in, you know, Emily Post's book. You know, if you go to a dinner party, if you get any kind of event that you're invited to, you need to RSVP because people need to know how many people they can expect to be at that event. So make sure you RSVP. And if it's on a meetup group or something like that, if you are RSVP, everybody else is going to see that, wow, yeah, you're coming. So, yeah, I know that, you know, these four people really love to play this particular game. So it gives people an opportunity to determine ahead of time 
what games are going to be played based on who's coming and the number of people that are coming. So it's important. So, you know, and if you don't RSVP and show up, that's bad. I've already talked about that. If you do RSVP and don't show up, then that's bad as well. It's, it's, it's bad both ways. So just RSVP one way or the other. Now, if something changes, again, just let people know. Let people know that you said you were coming, but something's come up and you can't. Or if you RSVP that you weren't coming and something's changed and now you can come, let them know that also. All right. So very easy. Just if you're invited to, to a gaming event, let the organizer know if you're coming or not. One way or the other. It's very simple. It's something that you should really focus on every time you're invited to something. If you're a person that never RSVPs and nobody knows if you're coming or not, sometimes you do come, sometimes you, you don't come, then you're going to be known as the wild card, right? And people aren't going to like that. People don't appreciate that. So always RSVP. Number 14, put down your portable device. Now, this is something I have to work on as well. I think in this new digital connected world that we live in, it's becoming more and more difficult. We're more connected to our work all the time. You may be expecting an important email. Maybe you have a Kickstarter project going on and you hear that bing and you want to see if it was a pledge, you know, whatever the reason. We've got to learn to put our phones away, or better yet, don't bring it to your game group. You are there to interact with other people face to face, right? Some of us play board games to get away from that digital world and have that real human connection. So, you know, if you're at your game group and people are playing, don't be sitting there on your phone, you know, especially if you're playing another game on your phone. Come on, that's not a, you know, if you're playing a game, a real a, a physical cardboard game with other people, that's not the place to be playing, you know, Stone Age on your iPad or your iPhone. Don't do it. You know, you don't, is it really that important that you have to check your email during the game? If there is something important, let people know. Say, hey, you know, my cousin's having a baby and I want to be, I, I need to have my phone just so I know when it happens, you know. If there's something really important where you need to be checking your phone, let people know that. All right. But don't be looking at your device the whole time during a gaming session. If you're playing a brand new game that you haven't played before and somebody is nice enough to explain the rules to everybody and they're doing a rules explanation and you're sitting there looking at your phone, that's rude. I hate to, you know, I've got to be blunt. That's just rude. Somebody is taking the time to explain the game to you and you're not looking, you're not paying attention. You're looking at your phone and when you start playing, you have no clue and they've got to explain it all over again. Now that's impacting everybody else's playing time. And that's not fair. And that's not, that's why it's not good that you're, that you're looking at your phone, right? If everybody's playing and it gets to your turn and you don't even know it's your turn because you're looking at your phone and they have to say, oh, it's your turn, go. And then you don't know what's been going on and you got to spend a lot more time. That's not good. All right. Number 13, don't be a rules lawyer. Now, I don't want you to think I'm saying rules are not important. Rules are very important. And you want to make sure you're playing a game according to the rules as they're written. However, if there's a discrepancy or a debate or an argument or a point of contention that comes up over the rules of the game that you're playing, and you know the rule, don't argue about it. Okay, look it up in the rule book. Find the specific example in the rule book that, you're, that the debate has started about and read it out loud from the book verbatim to everybody playing the game. That way everybody knows exactly what the rule book as it's written and there's none of this fighting and bickering back and forth. All right, so I know that can be hard to do sometimes, especially if you're really certain on a rule, but it's always better to go to the rule book and read it verbatim so you don't start some kind of rules argument that ruins the experience for everybody. 
So that's my number 13 is try not to be a rules lawyer. Try to be a rules judge that bases it on the ultimate piece of evidence that you have, and that's the rule book. Number 12, don't expect everybody else playing the game to know the rules. Now, especially if you're teaching the game, it's up to you to know the rules and teach them. Don't expect everybody else to know. So when they try to make a move that's illegal or they have a question about a rule, don't react negatively to them. Um, explain the rule to them over again if you've already explained it. They may have missed it. Some rules take a, a couple, maybe three, four times even, uh, to sink in with some players. So just reiterate the rules if there's any questions. Now, sometimes you'll play a game that you've never played before. Maybe your group just got a new game and you want to try it for the first time and all you've done is read the rule book. And that's okay. You're going to fumble through. If it's a complex game, you're going to fumble through it. You're going to have to refer to the rule book when you get stuck. Make sure everybody at the, at the table that's playing that game understands that. All right. And if you are involved in a game like that, where the people playing it are playing it for the first time, don't don't start getting on the person whose game. Don't get on anybody about the rules, right? Because you're all learning it together. All right. So don't expect other people to know the rules of the game. If you have a question on it, it's okay to go to the rule book, look it up read it out loud, explain it to everybody, so everybody can learn the proper rule at the same time. Number 11, be a good sport. Now, this is a basic one, right? This is something that our parents teach us when we're very small, when we're children. If you lose, lose gracefully. Don't complain and whine about, oh, I, you know, I would have won if I have done did this. You know, then you're kind of taking away somebody else's victory and kind of saying, well, you didn't really deserve to win that game. So lose gracefully. Congratulate the player that won the game. It's good sportsmanship. Just like in sports, it applies here because board games are a competition. Uh, so lose gracefully and win gracefully. When you win, don't gloat. You know, don't say, well, you know, and don't try to tell people what they did wrong. You know, if you can, you can do that. I shouldn't say never do that. You can do that, but you've got to be able to do it the right way. And you've got to know the person you're doing it, that you're explaining that, that kind of thing to. If you saw they made a really bad strategic decision, you know, just don't call them out in front of everybody and embarrass them. Like, well, you're so stupid. Here's what you did wrong. But you can explain it to them. Um, if you can do that in a nice way, do it. But remember that you're, you're treading a fine line there. Don't gloat. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, there's no opportunity for comedic gloating, right? Or if you win a game, if you've got those kind of good relationships with the people that you're playing with, that's fine. I'm not saying that. You've got, like, in all of these items in this list, you've got to use common sense, right? And you've got to know the people that you're playing with. You know, if somebody's very sensitive when they lose a game, then really don't gloat at all and don't try to tell them what they did wrong because it's going to hurt their feelings more, all right? And try to work on it when you lose a game. Sometimes, you know, and this is something I work on as well, but if you're really into a game and you're really trying your best and you've made some good moves and you're, 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 you, th you think you're going to win the game and in the end you lose the game, take a deep breath if it bothered you and thank the other person. Tell them that they did a good job. Thank everybody for playing and don't be a sore loser, all right? This is something we all have to work on all the time. Some people have to work on it more than others, but it's something we need to always be aware of is don't gloat and don't be a sore loser. Number 10, don't play board games to feed your ego. And this goes along, this is kind of connected to number 11, right, and not gloating. If you're playing board games to make yourself feel smarter, to boost your ego, to make you feel like you're smarter than other people, the people you're playing with, then you probably should really take a step back and ask yourself if, if that's something you should be doing, right? Board games, sure, they're competitive. Sure, and some games do 
take some level of intelligence to play. Some are more complex than others. But there's no, if, if, if that's how you get a sense of self-worth, uh, then I think you have an issue. And I think a lot of you know the kind of person that I'm talking about. Uh, the person that puts themselves, the pretentious person, right? If you're a pretentious person and you get a thrill out of beating other players into the ground and then gloating about it to build your own ego, then you're a loser. I hate to say it, but there's no other way to say it. You're a loser. Um, game should be fun for everybody involved. And you should judge yourself more by how much fun the other players have and how many times you can make them laugh than how many times you can win. Now, maybe that's my own philosophy. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe a lot of people are gonna hate me for saying that, but it's really the way I feel. You need to focus on the social aspects of gaming more than trying to win uh, so you can make yourself feel good. Number nine, don't leave people out. Now, I have seen this happen. I will say this is more rare. If you are the organizer of a game group or if you're organizing an event at your house or at a local game store or a restaurant or wherever you meet, then this is even more important for you. And I'll give you an example. Let's say you're holding a gaming event and nine people, including yourself, have, have RSVP'd that they're coming. Uh, it's, let's say it's going to start at 7 o'clock. All right, so everybody's there at 7 o'clock except one person. And so at 7.05, uh, two people want to play two different four-player games. As the game organizer, you should not allow that to happen, right? Because if you split into two groups of four, when that other player arrives, they're going to be out of luck. They're not going to be able to play anything until one of those games ends. So keep that in mind. Now this goes in, in, in line with being on time, which is going to be one of the other uh, items in this list. Um, but if, that, if somebody is late, give them a call, which that's another item in the list as well. Give them a call and say, you know, find out if they're going to be there. If they are going to be there, if they're just running a little late, then wait for them. Don't start a game uh, in your group that's going to mean someone is going to be left out of it. All right. When somebody comes to your group and they're look, they don't know anybody and they're looking around, introduce yourself, get their name, introduce them to other people, find out what they like, get them involved in a game and bring them into the group and see if they click. All right. So never try to leave people out. Now, sometimes that happens. If somebody's really late, you know, that's on them. You can't wait around for people forever. But if you know somebody's going to attend and they're a little bit late, don't start games that's going to leave them out. So that is my number nine. Don't leave people out. Number eight, take care of other people's games. We all have different levels of, of neatness. We all have different levels of how well we take care of our stuff. All right. And I'm not the kind of person who sleeves my cards and, you know, puts everything perfectly aligned in the box. I can, you know, I tend to throw stuff in there if I'm low on time. It's not that important to me, but I need to understand that it is important to some people, right? Some people are anal people and some people are slobs, right? Those are the two extremes. Most of us are somewhere in the middle. But you've got to, you know, like with anything, if it's somebody else's property, you need to respect it. All right. So that includes things like making sure you're not serving, you know, greasy snacks at your game night if you're hosting. Right. Don't serve potato chips or pizza. Or if you do serve stuff like that, eat it somewhere else. Take a break and eat it at a different table and socialize. And once you've eaten your pizza, uh, then you can go back to your game. It drives some people nuts when they're eating pizza with their game components and then touching their cards with their greasy hands. That doesn't bother me with my games, but be aware of it because it really does bother some people. And when we're talking about etiquette, we are talking about others, right? You are talking about making other fe people feel good, making other people feel welcome, and making sure other people are not uncomfortable. We're not talking about ourselves. 
So that's why it's important if you're playing with somebody else's game, take care of it. Um, don't bend their cards. You know, a lot of people like to fold their cards like this um, so other people can't see them and things like that. Be aware of how you're handling their components and be aware of where you're placing your drinks. You know, if you're placing your, you know, your Diet Coke on the table right there where you're placing your cards, condensation's going to happen, right, uh, on the bottom of your glass and the table's going to get wet before you know what the cards are wet. Right, so be aware of that stuff. Try to keep your food and drinks off the main playing table. If you're a host, try to have smaller tables off to the side that are separate where people can put their food, their snacks, and their drink. All right, try to choose snacks that are not greasy and aren't gonna cause trouble. You know, cra uh, pretzels, crackers, grapes, uh, you know, stuff like that. That stuff, uh, works very well. Just try to avoid the greasy stuff. So that is my number eight. Take care of other people's games when you're using them. Number seven, don't always play only the games that you want to play. You've got to be willing to expand your horizons now and then. If you're the kind of person who only likes to play Agricola or only likes to play a war game or only likes to play Twilight Imperium, you've got to expand your horizons and be willing to play games that other people bring into the group now and then. We all have games that we love. We all have games that we're always willing to bring to the table. And it's very good for you to bring your games to a game night and be willing to teach them but also be willing to sit in the role of a student from time to time and let somebody else get a game they've been wanting to get to the table. Um, you're going to enable them to do that uh, by being open to playing new games. So this is a very simple one and there's usually not a problem with this. But from time to time I have met people who only want to play one type of game or only want to play one particular game or never, you know, they never want to play a game that they haven't played before. Um, so don't let that be you. Uh, you're there to have fun, learn new games, and be willing to try new things. Number six, don't create conflicting events with your local game group. So if you are part of a local gaming community and there is a regular meetup or a regular Facebook group, or you know, maybe the, the group you're part of meets every Saturday morning or they meet every Wednesday night to play games. Don't create a, a, a game night that conflicts with what's already pre-existing. What you want to do is create a game night that where there is not one available to your local community yet. That gives people more options and doesn't split groups apart. Um, it's good etiquette to make sure you coordinate with the groups you're part of if you want to create a gaming event to make sure you do it in a schedule that is helpful to the community and does not separate the community. So this is a very basic uh, thing. All it does is take a little effort in scheduling on your part. Now, of course, this doesn't apply if you can't make it to the local game night and you just want to have a friend or a few friends over uh, to play a game. That's a different story. But if you are creating a whole event that you're publicizing out to the community, don't conflict with the other local game groups. Work together with them. Number five, don't always be the AP guy. If you don't know what AP is, it stands for analysis paralysis. And it's those times when it's your turn that you take forever to make your move because you're thinking different scenarios through in your head. Now, it's okay to have analysis par paralysis. Everybody gets it at some point, depending on the game that you're playing. Um, more complex games are more prone to AP than games that are not as complex. But don't be the person who always takes forever every turn. And this is especially bad if you are not paying attention to what's going on, and then when it comes to your turn, you sit there and have to think for 10 minutes before you make your move. You need to be present in the game, right? You need to be there and be paying attention to what's going on, thinking ahead when it's not your turn, during other players' turn, 
trying to determine what your, your possible next move is going to be. So when it does come to your turn, you're somewhat prepared to make your move on your turn. So you're not sitting there thinking and thinking and thinking. Uh, AP problems can really drag a game out and make them boring. Um, and people aren't going to have the best experience if there's a lot of AP in a game. So something to consider. It's again not something that is horrible if it ever happens to you. It's going to happen to you. But don't try not to be the person who always takes too long. Try to work on that and improve and improve how quickly you make your moves. Number four, don't be a complainer. Don't be Debbie Downer during the game. You're playing a game to have fun. You're working your mind and you're socializing with other people. Don't be the person who's always complaining about this mechanic is stupid. It should have been this way. Or that card is too powerful. Or, oh, if I would have just done this. Or, oh, you know, why did you really have to do that to me? That doesn't make any sense. You know, don't complain and whine throughout a game if things aren't going your way. It turns people off and it's it's kind of, it belittles people if you're whining, especially about a game that they brought to the table or a game that they really enjoy. Just make the best out of it. If you're not truly enjoying it, just suck it up and try to get the most out of it that you can. Don't be a whiner. Don't be a complainer uh, when you're playing the game. All right, number three, offer to help clean up. When the game is done, especially if it's a game with a lot of components, you just played the game, right? You know what components were part of the game and, and what you probably know what bags they go in if you saw it being set up. Help clean up. Put your pieces in their bags. Get the cards together in the right decks that where they belong. Uh, put the dice in bags if, they, if there's bags for the dice. If you're unsure of where stuff goes, ask the owner of the game where they would like you to put your stuff. Um, a lot of times there are people who don't want you to help clean up because they have a very particular way of putting uh, components back in their box. And that's fine if they don't want help, but it's not okay for you not to offer. Always offer to help pick up. Because when everybody picks up a little bit, it can be done quickly and you can move on to the next game. It's really rude, really rude if you finish a game and get up and leave without offering anything and not even saying goodbye and just going on to the next table to play the next game. That's just out rude. Don't ever do that. Offer to help clean up and if the owner says no, I'll do it myself, then you're free to go. So this is just basic etiquette stuff here. Offer to, to be helpful when the game is over. And also, when the, when the game is being set up, if you're there, offer to help. Maybe you can shuffle some decks. Maybe there's resources you could put on, out on the board. Um, just ask the question. Number two, don't be the person who never gives somebody a move back. Now... I do have to qualify this. If you're in a two-player game and it's a competitive game, right, then I think then it's different. It might be okay to not allow, you know, in a game of chess or an abstract strategy game where it's two-on-two, two, you, you know, if you lift your finger off the piece, maybe that's a rule. As long as you understand that rule and that it's a competitive game, I think it's okay. Um, but... If you're the kind of person who never lets anybody take a, a move back, especially if they're a new player who's never played the game before, um, then that's that's not cool. Let it, It's a game. It's not a bar exam. Relax. If somebody wants a move back and it's, it hasn't revealed any hidden information or their move hasn't changed the state of the game, let them take it back and make another move. You don't want to win a game anyway because somebody made a bad move. You'd rather win a game because you played the best that you could. So it's always, it just creates better environment if you're more apt to let somebody take back a move than not to. Now sometimes this can't happen, right? Like I said, if it reveals hidden information or sometimes, you know, or sometimes maybe there was, there was some kind of diplomacy or trickery that you employed in the game 
to get somebody to make that move and then they didn't realize it until after they made it. Those cases are, are exceptions to the rule. Uh, the key word here is don't always, don't always be the person who says no. Let people have moves back. All right, here we are, my number one thing that you should not do as a board gamer. A very important piece of etiquette here. Don't quit and walk out on a game. Now, if it's a two-player game and you know you can't win and you can concede the game, you can ask your opponent, I concede the game, is that okay? And they accept, then that's okay, right? Because they've won the game and you both know they've won the game and you're just conceding. But in multiplayer games where your exit from the game will impact the game and now nobody can finish the game because you decided you want to leave that's not a cool thing to do don't do it now if there's some emergency your wife calls and she's you know having having a baby if there's some issue that comes up and you have to leave i'm not talking about that i'm talking about if you're playing somebody's playing a game with a group and they say oh this really isn't i don't really like this game i'm gonna i'm gonna bow out no, not not cool. If you've sat down and agreed to play it, then you should play it till it's over because it's not fair to everybody else. All right. It's a basic common courtesy that you stick it out. So because other people might really be in, enjoying the game. And if you leave, you're going to throw off the whole balance of the game and it's just going to ruin it for everybody. And, and that's not fair. And if, if uh, some people will do this if they're losing a game, too. If, some, if you're really losing a game, uh, that doesn't mean you can get up and leave, right? Because other players might be dependent on, on, on what your position on the board or, or whatever. Um, so don't leave a game. Um, stick it out. And, you know, there will be another game after this one. You're going to be able to play something you like after this game. It's not going to kill you. So that's my number one thing is don't quit in the middle of a game. It's rude. Don't do it. <laughs> All right. So there you have it. You know, I, I put this list up on Board Game Geek and there was some great reaction to it. There was a lot of bad reaction to it. You know, how dare you tell people how they should behave and this is common sense. And it is. A lot of this stuff, it, it is common sense. But yet, when, you know, I've been in certain game environments, I'm not going to say where or who, um, I've seen these things happen still. And we're all human, right? So these things are going to happen. I'm guilty of these things. I walked out on a game once and I'm never, ever going to do it again. Because once it happened to me, I realized, well, that's just not cool. Um, so there, there, it's stuff that we have to think about as gamers all the time. Especially if you're like me and you're competitive, you're a competitive person, uh, you can tend to get caught too much, caught up too much in the game and winning. Because it's really, it's not about the winning. It's about being with people and having fun. Sure, you want to win and you want to, you know, you, know, you want to exercise your brain and all those positive things that go along with board gaming. But the social element of board gaming is a huge part of it. And it's the biggest part of it for me. It's why I really love the hobby is the social aspect. So we really need to focus on those social things. We need to think about them. We need to think about how we react in certain situations, whether we let somebody take a move back. Um, and you know, I'm guilty. Sometimes I will just be reactionary and I'll do something and I'm like, oh, that was a kind of a dick move. So I'm, I'm gonna start with me and try to improve myself as, as I go to different gaming events. And I hope you will too. I hope you'll just think about some of these things. Think about other things too. I think there's a lot of honorable mentions. Some people said, you know, take a shower was one that some people said. I thought that was a little too basic, but I think, uh, I, I guess there are issues with some people who just, you know, they smell because their personal hygiene isn't up to par. So yeah, I think things like that could qualify uh, for this list as, as well. So you may have, th may have things that you would like to add to this list, but the bottom line is think about the social aspects of gaming and how you can be a better gamer to make people feel more welcome 
and be considerate of how they feel and how they experience games. That's the bottom line. I hope this was helpful. Uh, again, a lot of it is common sense, but if it was, why do we keep doing this stuff over and over again? Anyway, I'm Robert Burke. Thanks for watching, and I'll be back again uh, with a, another game review soon. Bye.